Well, it's been a while since I did anything about movies, and some of the older videos are pretty crappy. So I might as well make a new video breaking down the scientific accuracies and inaccuracies of a movie that portrays uh, prehistoric stuff so I have an excuse to talk about some science facts. And I just watched a pretty eh, meh, if not crappy movie called 10,000 BC that was filled with a ton of prehistoric and ancient history topics, so why not? This will be a pretty in-depth discussion of what life was probably like 12,000 years ago, based on the scientific evidence, and I'll just be using the 10,000 BC film to talk about a time period in history that I really love. If I haven't told you guys before, I'm a massive history buff, especially for prehistory and ancient history, because it's a very cool point where prehistory meshes with human history, and I just find this period fascinating. Throughout this video, I'll be pointing out and highlighting some of the things the movie does right and what it does wrong in accordance to the scientific evidence, ranging from paleontological points to historical points to archaeological points. I hope you enjoy and more importantly learn something new. Oh, I also got criticized recently for not citing sources directly, so for now on, I'll try to show my sources more often. My citations will appear on screen normally in the corner, and at the end of the video there'll be a bibliography, and probably in the description as well. Also. For anyone wanting to do research on Paleolithic and Neolithic stuff, be careful to check if your sources say 10,000 BCE or 10,000 years ago. It can get you in a lot of trouble, about 2,000 years worth of it. Alright, I've talked too long already, so without further ado, this is 10,000 BCE. The more scientifically accurate and historically accurate 10,000 BC. So, 10,000 BC starts out in what we can assume is 10,000 BCE, at the end of the Upper Paleolithic period and the beginning of the Mesolithic, with a tribe of Homo sapien hunter-gatherers called the Yagal, living in what appears to be the Ural Mountains or maybe Siberia. It's unclear, both these possibilities are accurate, modern humans have been living in the Urals for about 75,000 years, and several archaeological sites like Kapova Cave and the Ignavieka Cave illustrate these humans lived in the region both before and after 10,000 BCE, and often depicted the wildlife that existed there. Siberia was obviously inhabited by early humans as well. The Malta Beret culture existed there for a while, from about 22,000 BCE to 13,000 BCE, and possessed an interesting culture, most famously creating female figurines out of mammoth ivory, often referred to as the Venus figurines, which likely had some sort of religious significance. This is no surprise, as by this time, Homo sapiens were very widely dispersed. The aboriginals had already been in Australia for tens of thousands of years, the island of Japan had been already inhabited, and the ancestors of the Native Americans, whom the Multiburet culture had a genetic close relationship to, had already scrambled across the Bering Land Bridge to colonize the New World. In fact, every continent except for Antarctica was already inhabited by man at this point in time. The Yagal appear to be primarily based on several nomadic cultures living throughout the Russian plain during the Upper Paleolithic. The structures look alright to me, but I'm not a huge expert in the field. But I know that it has been proven that ancient humans did use mammoth bones and other animal remains to build huts in a similar manner. Many structures like this have been unearthed throughout Eurasia. Interestingly, studies on these bones in a single dwelling vary in age by several thousands of years, suggesting that these bones were passed down many generations, or at least collected from long dead animals. The Yagal's hunting style is likely not accurate. We have very limited, unambiguous evidence of humans hunting mammoths directly, and we know even fewer about how Homo sapiens likely killed woolly mammoths. Of the little evidence we have, a Siberian thoracic vertebrae of a woolly mammoth was discovered with a large and deep puncture mark produced by a quartzite spear tip. The spear must have been embedded so deep that it would have caused a great deal of pain, blood loss, and possibly death for the mammoth. The fact that the spear tip was embedded so high on the back, it implies that it was thrown from a safe distance and not in close combat. Our close relatives, the Neanderthals, show evidence they similarly attacked from a distance by usage of thrown spears. Close combat seems like it was neither especially favored nor successful. It's likely early humans used superior elevations such as on top of cliffs and ledges to throw objects from above, like boulders and projectiles, onto the mammoths. Interestingly, a study concerning mammoth hunting in Yana, Siberia during the 20,000 BCE illustrates that the Yana humans hunted mammoths sporadically, presumably when ivory for tools was necessary. It seems likely that mammoth hunting might have been a rarer occasion for early humans than the movie suggests. The Yigal themselves, however, are a mixed bag. To some extent, I must applaud the film for having a cast with such ethnic diversity. Having actors that are of mixed race, Pacific Island descent, native Brazilian, European, Egyptian, African, Hispanic, etc. to portray the Yigal, and in doing so keeping their race ambiguous. 
This is somewhat clever because at this time in history, the racial divisions between humans hadn't yet fully formed, due to most of our relatively recent migration from Africa and the Middle East to other parts of the world. It's a fascinating subject, and I'd love to do a more in-depth talk about it in another video, concerning how humans evolved and diversified to the wide range of facial structures, skin colors, etc. that we see today. In this respect, the film did well, as most movies, and most media for that matter, about early humans often portray cave people that are way too... how do I put this? White, white. for their time period. A favorite movie of mine called The Quest for Fire avoids this common trope really well. Taking place 80,000 years ago, the race and skin color of humans at this time would have been even less differentiated than it would be in 10,000 BCE. To compensate for this, many of the actors are of mixed race, or are in so much makeup and costume that it is too difficult to determine their race. Race during prehistoric times and how it developed with us is very complex, and again a topic I'd like to go in more in depth than at another time. So for now, I'll focus on the appearance of what people of this particular region in this particular time period look like. Firstly, although I just complimented the racial and ethnic diversity for it illustrating how little racial and ethnic divisions there were in early humans, the ethnic diversity of the tribe is a problem. The Yagal as a tribe are way too diverse for their time period. None of the tribe members look too close in resemblance to one another, and this is, of course, as a result of the caste being of many different ethnic backgrounds. Most tribes would be much more homogeneous and much closer related like a family unit. A tribe would more or less look the same, with nowhere near the diversity exhibited in the movie. The people who lived in Eastern Europe at this time did not look exactly like this. Some of the lighter-skinned actors aren't necessarily accurate. Light skin in humans was a relatively recent phenomena and traveled back 12,000 years and many, if not all, European humans still very much possessed the dark skin of their African ancestors. 8,000-year-old remains from Hungary showed that humans living there were dark-skinned. Other humans at the time, such as in Italy and Luxembourg, were similarly dark-skinned. The Yenma culture, which would later inhabit the general region during the Bronze Age, 4000 BCE, additionally possessed overwhelmingly brown eyes, dark hair, and a skin color that was moderately light but still darker than the modern Europeans. Swedish and Scandinavian hunter-gatherers 8,000 years ago, such as the Motala people, were in fact lighter skin, but they were the minority. Interestingly, these early Swedes might have a genetic relationship with East Asian and Native American populations. A certain derived mutation of a gene, commonly found in East Asians and Native Americans, have been found in these lighter-skinned Montala people and other Scandinavian populations, suggesting there was a gene flow between the several groups' ancestors. Anyways, you can see that light skin is very uncommon, even just 8,000 years ago. Go back even further, to 12,000 years ago, you get the picture that darker-skinned, dark-eyed, and dark-haired Europeans would have been the vast majority, and the light skin might not have even existed at all in Europeans. Siberian peoples at around this time looked different as well. The malta Berek culture was very closely related genetically, and probably physically, to Native Americans, as well as several still existing nomadic Siberians, such as the Kets, the closest non-American living relatives to Native Americans. They also contributed much to the genetic ancestry of the aforementioned Yamea people. They possessed brown eyes, dark hair, and dark skin, and many archaeologists have suggested they would have an appearance close to many of their surviving relatives. The Yagal aren't terrible, they just could have been improved upon a little bit. If the film is set in Siberia, then have more Native American looking actors, or maybe European Native American mixed actors. If we are in Eastern Europe, have darker skinned, dark haired, and brown eyed actors. Significantly light skinned Europeans wouldn't be common for a while, probably not until about 6000 BCE. It's a good thing most of the Yigal have brown or dark hair color, as blonde or red hair probably wouldn't be common for another few thousand years. During the later periods of the Mesolithic, the Volga in Ural region, as well as much of Western Europe, would later be become populated by a sizable minority of red-haired people. Red or light-colored hair and light-colored eyes, such as blue or green in Western Eurasia, continued and increased during the Bronze Age, and is supported by illustrations by ancient Chinese artists of Tocharians, as well as genetic evidence. As of 10,000 BCE, though, such traits don't appear to have existed yet. Evelet, the lead female, is said to be of a different tribe, likely to the southwest. Her most striking feature, bright blue eyes, is sadly inaccurate for the time. The mutation for blue eyes wouldn't appear in humans for, at the very least, under their 4,000 to 6,000 years. And the earliest evidence of blue-eyed Europeans is from about 5,700 BCE in Sweden, in the Motala people, and in some southern European populations around 5,000 BCE, specifically in Spain. 
Before 8000 BC, blue eyes didn't even exist in the human population around the world. Again, interestingly, some of these first blue-eyed Europeans were not white or light-skinned per se. That evidence shows that the blue-eyed Spaniards were still dark-skinned. The blue-eyed and dark-skinned phenotype is something almost entirely missing in today's European populations, and the combination would truly give these early humans a unique appearance. Later we see the Yagals have a shaman living with them called Old Mother. It is highly implied that the Old Mother is a Neanderthal or other type of archaic human such as a Denisovan or a Red Deer cave person. I find it most likely she is supposed to be a Neanderthal because they are the most famous of the non-homo sapien humans. However, Neanderthals were long dead by this point, becoming extinct about 30,000 years prior. However, they do say she is uh, the very last of her kind. It's possible she is a homo sapien with just a larger percentage of Neanderthal ancestry than normal. Neanderthals and humans did interbreed, and even modern humans still possess a small amount of Neanderthal DNA. A Bronze Age homo sapien mummy named Otzi is said to have possessed a higher degree of Neanderthal ancestry than modern humans. And another much older human named Wase One, my Romanian is terrible, who lived 37,800 years ago, additionally had a recent Neanderthal ancestry, with a Neanderthal ancestor four to six generations prior. Meaning this guy must have had a great, 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 great grandfather or mother who was a Neanderthal. To put that in perspective, if I were to go back four to six generations, my ancestors would still be living during the Civil War. Yeah, that recent of ancestry. Wase 1 as well as Wase 2 even retained some Neanderthal traits mixed with sapien ones. One such was wider cheekbones. And remember, this is after the extinction of Neanderthals, so a part of them lived on within some of us. Perhaps Old Mother simply has significantly more Neanderthal ancestry than her hosts, and thus is considered the quote-unquote last of her kind, meaning she is the last significantly part Neanderthal human left, as all the Neanderthal genes have been watered down by Homo sapien ones elsewhere. If she is supposed to be an entirely Neanderthal woman, then they did a meh job here. Um, she is depicted as shorter than other humans and has a thicker, bulkier body type, which is accurate to what we know of Neanderthals. The only problem is that Neanderthals, or at least some of them, had light skin and red or blonde hair. Old Mother, on the other hand, has darker skin and is played by an actress who is of Chinese and black Jamaican descent. Regardless, I found this very interesting as her appearance truly felt purposely ambiguous, as it was very difficult to tell her ethnicity or race. I believe this was a smart decision on the director or casting or whoever's part. I bet an entirely different species of human would have this kind of effect on us, as their comparatively independent heritage would challenge our traditional ethnic standards and classifications. Us homo sapiens create our racial and ethnic groupings in accordance to our heritage. Other human species might break these groupings altogether. One can only imagine how something like a homo erectus would have looked if we were able to see their skin color and complexion. Homo erectus was much more ancient than us, and had a great deal more time to diversify into different races than us. Our racial diversity would look moot by comparison. Well, I digress. Apart from the nitpicks, I think her character design was... Eh, uh, was alright. It could be worse. I've seen much worse Neanderthal depictions. Now enough of the humans, for now let's move on to the mimics. Mimox? I forgot how they said it in the movie. As said before, later in the film we learn that the Yagal traditionally hunt and rely on woolly mammoths, migrating through their mountain range for food. However, over time, the mammoths came less and less and fewer and fewer. The woolly mammoths they depend on are, just like Old Mother, going extinct, and their traditional way of life with them. The mammoths we see in the film are heavily implied to be the last of the entire continent, if not the world, and this is great accuracy-wise of 10,000 BCE. The film is set right around the Quaternary Extinction event, when most of the megafauna around the world were becoming extinct, likely due to a combination between the climate change and human predation. Woolly mammoths were one of the animal populations most affected by this extinction, as their populations throughout Eurasia were rapidly shrinking. At the time the film is set, woolly mammoths still existed on the mainland, mainly in northern parts of Eastern Europe and Asia, such as Russia, Estonia, and Switzerland, and Ukraine, and even northern parts of Western Europe, such as France and Britain. Siberia was probably the part of the world with the densest population of woolly mammoths at the time, and was the location where the very last mammoths existed on the mainland, and that's why I tend to favor these opening scenes taking place there. The very last mammoth population on the mainland was in the, uh, jeez, I can't even pronounce that, peninsula of Siberia, 9,650 years ago, or 7,650 BCE, well after the date given in the film. So, this is accurate for the time. 
Fun fact is that the woolly mammoths continue to exist on inaccessible islands such as St. Paul Island and Riggle Island long after they became extinct on the mainland. Well into the start of human civilization, in fact, mammoths were still around as recently as 2000 BCE, when the Great Pyramids, that I will discuss later, were actually being built. The mammoth populations on these islands were very small. Regal Island, in particular, had around 500 to 1,000 individuals at a time. The mammoths themselves look pretty good. We know a great deal about what moly mammoths looked like while they were still alive. Our ancestors left us a massive collection of depictions of woolly mammoths made from life, some of them more detailed than others, and scientists have also found multiple well-preserved frozen mammoth specimens which kept soft tissue details like hair, skin, meat intact over the millennia. Due to this, it is probably the best known and understood of any prehistoric animal, so the margins for speculation and fiction for them are relatively small. That being said, the mammoths are, you know, very accurate. The tusk shape, hair coverage, musculature, fat, etc. look great and is consistent with the evidence. One nitpick is that the mammoths look a little too large for me. Woolly mammoths were about the size of modern male African elephants, and the tallest, which were the male, stood about 3 to around 3.4 meters, or 9.8 to 11.2 feet tall at the shoulder. Females were smaller, around 2.6 to 2.9 meters, or 8.5 to 9.5 feet tall. They were comparably shorter than most other species of mammoth, and the reason for this is unknown. That being said, I did a pretty rough estimate of the height of the woolly mammoths in the film and found that they were in fact oversized. In this shot, the actor is about 1.9 meters tall. Now using his height as a measurement, I found that the mammoth in the shot was at the shoulder about two and a half measurements tall, or around 4.7 meters tall or 15 and a half feet tall. I used the same method for other shots in the film and found that other mammoths were similarly oversized. This one, for instance, was about the same size as the one here. The size of the mammoths is somewhat inconsistent in other shots of the film, as in some scenes they are larger or smaller than others. This scene in particular has a mammoth being absurdly ginormous, standing 5.5 meters or 18 feet tall. At first I thought this was just a perspective thing, with the person supposed to be further away from the camera than the mammoth, but I believe the fact this character is hitting the mammoth with his staff illustrates they are supposed to be roughly the same distance from the camera. This one here is probably the largest mammoth in the film. I tried to do a very rough estimate and came up with something absurd around 8.5 meters or 30 feet tall at the shoulder, about as large as the Albert the Bull statue in Iowa. The size of the mammoths is less comparable to woolly mammoths and closer to the, the Colombian mammoth, which existed in the Americas. This scaling up of the size of the mammoths was likely done to make them look more imposing and intimidating to the audience, and I understand that. Just remember, real woolly mammoths weren't this huge. But let me clarify that they were still very big animals nonetheless. A character in the film says they found the lead bull. This is also very inaccurate. We know that woolly mammoths were likely matriarchal, just like modern elephants. The evidence shows that just like African elephants, males were kicked out of the herd upon reaching sexual maturity, and thus bulls weren't allowed in the social structure. A certain discovery can give some insight of why this is. The best preserved adult woolly mammoth head was that of a bull nicknamed the Yekejer mammoth. The specimen has temporal glands between the ear and the eye, a feature that is the same in bull elephants. The glands would secrete temperin, and the brain would produce testosterone resulting in the bull entering a heightened aggressive state, called must, during the mating season. Due to this, both mammoths and elephants would kick out males, as they would be a detriment to the stability of the herd. Real mammoth herds would likely instead have possessed a matriarch, an aged lead female with a large amount of experience just like modern elephants. Bulls likely would have been primarily solitary, probably only forming small groups with other males, only interacting with larger herds in search of females. The woolly mammoths are overall accurate, with some minor inaccuracies. So, good job on that, filmmakers. Much of the opening scenes are pretty great accuracy-wise, and doesn't really possess too many things anachronistic for the given time period. However, as the film goes on, it seems like it gets progressively more inaccurate and, how do I say this, schlocky, schlocky. over time. I mean, I mean oh, my oh my god, god. how embarrassing. Well, I guess I'll have to handle this next time. Tell me if I should make more videos like this in the future, or just stick with my other series. Hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. See you next time. End of part one.